who are with us uh, this morning to co-chair the virtual session. And we, um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Olivier Pluchery, who will give his talk now. So um, Dr. Pluchery received his PhD in laser physics from the University of Paris-Saclay in France. After <clears throat> a postdoc in the Bell Labs, uh, in Murray Hill in United States, he obtained a position in France as associate professor at Sorbonne University, previously known as um, Université Pierre et Marie Curie, and is now a full professor uh, since 2017 in the physics department. Dr. Pluchery developed his research at the Inst Institute of Nanoscience in Paris. His interest focuses presently on the electronic and electrical properties of gold nanoparticles and their relation to their optical and plasmonic properties. In particular, he launched a research program on the coupling between the hot electron generation of gold nanoparticles under plasmonic excitation and the molecular absorption on the nanoparticle surface. Besides, he has developed for his students a complete course on plasmonics with uh, dedicated lab works and a devoted textbook, textbook that we definitely want to know. And Dr. Pluchery is also the founder and the director of the very dynamic R Nano Research Network. And he has filled one patent, which is the foundation of the startup company uh, named Bichromatics. Uh, that creates new pigments based on the plasmonic colors and addresses the luxury market. So let's dance with him because uh, the title of uh, his presentation is Gold Nanoparticles and Plasmonics, let's make the electrons dance. So please. Well, Thanks a lot, Elodie, for your very kind words. And I'm so glad to be here in Quebec that I really like and to talk to you about the plasmonic party, let's say. Uh, I was really not sure about the title because to say the truth, I'm a poor dancer, but uh, it, I will not demonstrate anything here, but the electrons will. Um, well, the first time I, I was hearing about uh, plasmonics, that was through this kind of view graph that uh, some of you are familiar with and some of you just see some lines there. It was drawn by my PhD advisor who, uh, who was explaining me that this kind of uh, dispersion relationship was creating, was generating some very strange waves, the plasmon wave, that was able to sense less than one monolayer of mo uh, molecule onto a surface with very high sensitivity. He was telling words about evanescent waves, uh, coupling with dispersion wave. I didn't understand a word actually, but that was not the, my topic of the PhD. So I understood my PhD, but not this one. But what I was really struck is his kind of patient in his eyes when he was talking about these small waves crawling along the surface and able to sense very, very little amount of molecules. And uh, later on, uh, I met some people in plasmonics with the same kind of strange feeling of patient or uh, infection, maybe the plasmonic infection, we might say. And, and finally, I decided to go into this party. Um, and as you may know, the best way to understand something is to teach it. And so I decided to set up a course with lab work and about plasmon, plasmonics. And during these next 40 minutes, I will try to, to give you a flavor of this course. And it will not take 10 hours like the thing I am using, used to do, but I will try to string that into 40 minutes. So stop me if I go to the 10 hours. <laughs> um, so plasmonics is now kind of big tree that was planted something like 40 years ago, more or less, with some uh, fundamental uh, experiments uh, by Bolitberg, uh, a book by Boran of Hoofman. I will not go into the details, but it grew up with a, a tree in, into a tree with many, many different applications. Uh, and I will talk about some of them, plasmonic circuitry, biosensing a little bit, cancer therapy, plasmonic pigments, and what is interesting is in during these last five years, this tree uh, kind of merged with another tree, which is nanoelectronics. Um, nanoelectronics 
and all the behavior of charges at the very localized uh, uh, regime uh, that gives, gave rise to what we call hot electron physics. And what I will try today is to show at the end of my talk how these two uh, knowledge merge together into this hot electron physics, which is actually something a hot topic uh, right now. Well, so let's start with the, the plasmonic with the, the dance of the electron. And these electrons, they know to, how to dance at very high tempo. This tempo is the, the optical frequency. So optical frequency is 10 to the 15 Hertz. So very high. And the, the story of this dance is a coupling between uh, the, an electromagnetic wave that we can, uh, so that's the oscillation of the electric field that way, that we can represent with this uh, complex formula uh, of the electric field, so E0 times uh, exponential i k uh, minus omega t. And what is important here is that there is uh, the space coordinates here, which is linked to the wavelengths, 500 nanometer. So for the nanoscientist, that's a big scale. And then uh, this uh, omega, which is the tempo at which this oscillation takes place. Well, there is no electron here. It's just the electric field oscillating in free space. Now, what happens when you, uh, this uh, wave hits the surface, uh, it will make the, the electron oscillate. And these electrons uh, are not used to dance as this high tempo. And as a consequence, they will damp this uh, uh, wave when it's going into the surface. And the damping is represented by the dielectric function. I will talk a lot about this dielectric function, which in the case of the metal uh, occurs to be a negative uh, number. And uh, the behavior of the wave inside the metal can be summarized by the uh, dispersion relationship that we have here. And I will talk a lot about dispersion relationships, uh, which write that way, K2 is omega2 over C2 times the dielectric function. And you can see here, this is negative number. Here we have a, a square that will turn to be negative. And as a function, you end up with imaginary number. So you, you will need to do a little bit of math like that and like that for the next 20 minutes. Um, and that's really decide how the wave goes into the metal. And it doesn't go very far. It goes just 30 nanometer deep. That's what we call the skin depth of the metal. And this will really uh, decide how the wave, that we, uh, how these two waves will couple together, the electromagnetic wave, wave and what we call the polarization wave, so the polariton inside the, the metal. And uh, the whole thing of plasmonics is to, to answer this question, is it possible to synchronize the dances? Or says that in uh, physical world, is it possible to couple an electromagnetic wave with the polarization wave? And the answer is yes, but it's not so easy. And that's the reason why it took so many years, so many years. I mean, the equations are there for 150 years, but it took many years to really uh, find out how to, to, to do this coupling. And so the coupling may happen uh, in two situations. Uh, so first, the definition I will use that the plasmon is a couple oscillation between this electromagnetic wave and the polarization wave in the metal. This coupling occurs either in the surface within the 30 nanometer skin depth or in other situation when the material is so thin that everything is surface. That's the case of nanoparticle. So when you have nanoparticle, let's say smaller than 30 nanometer, in that case, you will have this coupling. And this gives rise to the two families of plasmon, the surface plasmon polariton, which is called also the, uh, the propagating, propagating plasmon. And the second one, which is the localized surface plasmon resonance linked to the nanoparticle. Well, so let's start with this propagating plasmon and I will show you how it, it can lead, it will lead to the integ integrated photonic circuits. 
So can we mix this electromagnetic wave with the surface? The answer is, gi is given by the mathematical derivation uh, that is here. And uh, so I will be quick here. There are three steps with the three boxes. The first one is to write this electric field at the two interfaces, then apply what we call the boundary conditions, see how they can dance together, let's say. And with this, you solve the equation and you end up with this uh, red equation in, in red, here in the red box, which is really the key that opens everything in SPP, so surface plasma polarity, the dispersion relationship. And when we go into this relationship, that's what we obtain here. So here we have the, parametric, the electric permittivity. Epsilon one is the one of the metal below. This one is from the dielectric, so the insulating later layer, which is above, which could be water, air, or molecules, or something which should be transparent, let's say. And this number is positive. This one is negative. Then when you do the math here, um, if this is negative enough, it could give this square root being positive. And so you have a positive wave number here. As a function, uh, as a consequences, the electric field right like this, you have here, for those who remember, I mean, the electromagnetic courses, a propagating term along the X axis, so along the surface. And you have here, a damping term, uh, which uh, represents the wave, which actually uh, is evanescent in the Z direction. And so this is the magic of this uh, small uh, wave, uh, plasma wave. It's a wave that crawls along the surface like this, and uh, above and below, these two waves are conjugating. And what is interesting is the number that are here, the wave damp, uh, is vanishing away from the surface. But if you are in water, you can calculate that this damping distance is just 92 nanometers, so on, of the order of magnitude of one nanometer, uh, 100 nanometers, sorry. So that's very little. So that means that uh, you have a big wave of 500 nanometer wavelength that will be able to sense, to probe very uh, little thin layer close to the surface. And that's really what is interesting because you can access to the nano dimension with this macro or I mean, uh, that, that's optical wave. And this gives the first uh, kind of application uh, linked to the SPP wave. That's that the one who started in 1891 uh, with Bolitberg and some other people, and I think Jiri Omola, who is here, uh, has been uh, contributing a lot to this also. Um, it gave rise to the SPP-based biosensor. So this biosensor, the idea is to have the gold layer with water here. So the, that's the interface I was talking about. And then uh, there is a lot of biochemistry. So that's the, the magic of the, the chemist who are able to functionalize uh, the gold surface so that it will be uh, able to recognize some specific antibody. And here I'm presenting uh, the work from uh, Suya Bujdai, so initial work from her. Um, and here we can see all the sequences when you prepare the surface and then at the end when you make the sensing and so it's really sensitive to very, very low amount of materials. And as you know, it grew up into several companies and I'm happy to see that next tomorrow, I think tomorrow there is a workshop uh, proposed by one of these company about the SPS sensing, which turned to be something really, really useful into the biochemistry uh, topic area. Well, so this is, probably the, uh, the, the largest success story of plasmonics, this very tiny wave who was able to, let's say, to give jobs to hundreds of people uh, through these uh, SPP uh, biosensors. However, so uh, 
how to launch a, a SPP wave. And that's tricky here. Because if you try naively to uh, send a laser onto a gold surface, like, uh, like here, you will never be able to launch this, to, to, to generate this uh, SPP wave. And that's the reason why it took so many years, I mean, to, to be able to, to make sure that th this way exists. And so, uh, yeah, and because, because it's a way that is so thin that if, even if you generate it, you cannot put a detector within a layer of 100 nanometer. So uh, th that was the one of the issue. And so if you want the answer, how to generate a SPP wave, we need to go back to the um, dispersion relationship. And to understand this, we can see the interaction of the plasmon with the surface as a collision between a photon and a plasmon. And if you uh, remember the, the, the course from high school, actually, you know that during a collision, you have to, to respect the law of conservation of energy and of momentum. So energy, that means we will keep the same color. So if we are launching with a helium neon laser, the SPP wave, we have this wavelength also. And the momentum is given by the wave vector K. And the best way to plot actually these uh, two um, figure, that's the dispersion relationship. That's this kind of relationship that we see every, everywhere in condensed matter physics. And the reason why is because of this law of conservation. Well, um, if we plot the dispersion relationship of the excitation wave, it's just a straight line, omega egal C kx. And if we plot now the dispersion relationship of the plasmon, that's this uh, curved line. So, and there is no crossing here, except at zero. So nothing give nothing, it's not a big deal. Um, but the, the, the issue is how can we make this excitation line cross this one? And Kretschmann in 1968 came up with this idea of which seems simple, uh, placing a prism on top of this surface. If you do that, actually, the incoming wave is now crossing a uh, material with a uh, optical index of N3. And in that uh, situation, it will um, give, go to a dispersion relationship, which is that kind. So that's the same as, as before, but with a term that can be lower than, uh, greater than one. And so the slope is decreasing and you can eventually have a slope that will cross this uh, plasmon line. And so what is nice is that here, you see there is the incidence angle. And so by changing the incidence angle, we can tune this line so that it will cross this SPP line. And that's really the basics of any SPR experiments to adjust the plasmon so that the, the angle, so that we can excite the plasmon at a given wavelength. And that was actually my, the, the first, um, lab work I set up for my students. Um, if you want to buy a SPR uh, apparatus, it's usually in the order of magnitude of 20, 40, 40,000 euro. Uh, and so for sure for teaching, I cannot afford this, but uh, actually we can not replace, but have this uh, idea with just this kind of very simple setup where you see the prism here. Here I have evaporated a very thin layer of gold and then uh, we shine light on it. Uh, here it's white light, but we, I was using a laser also. And the experiments just uh, consist in rotating the prism and make a placing a photodiode here. And we detect what is reflected by the prism. And what is reflected is everything that has not been used for launching the plasmon. And so, we end up with this kind of SPP extinction curve where there is a big dip at one given angle and a sharp resonance. And this dip corresponds to the lack, so the non-reflected energy, so all the energy which has been absorbed by the plasmon. So with here, we don't detect the plasmon, but we detect the energy absorbed by the plasmon. And yeah. And what is extremely sensitive is that if you change a little bit the surrounding medium, so you change the, yeah, you add a little bit of ethanol into water, it will shift this uh, curve 
and that makes all the sensitivity of plasma. And with a very simple setup like this, we can even detect one monolayer of, uh, of molecule onto a, a surface. Um, I didn't succeed to do it because I was not a biochemist and I was messing up the surface actually, but the sensitivity was there, uh, is here. And so that's the reason why my chip setup will not uh, be commercialized and that you have to pay the price to have something really sturdy um, uh, working well. And that's, you will have more explanation probably tomorrow by the, the people from Affinity, I think. Uh, well, so that's what the advertisement for our sponsor. Uh, so biochemistry, but can we think about plasmon for signal processing? So where is the question here? So with electrical signal processing that we have in our computer, we know that there is very high miniaturization. We are below 20 nanometer in terms of uh, yeah, gate oxide and so the thickness of the transistor. These processors are able to perform very complex operations, but as you may know, the frequency has been blocked for something like 15 years to four gigahertz. We cannot go higher for electrical reasons, so yeah. And on the other way, hand, you know that when you want to have high speed signal processing, high speed telecommunication, you go to optics. And because the carrier frequency is so high, that's this dance of electron at a high tempo actually, but the miniaturization is very low. The core of the fiber optic is 50 micrometer. So 1000 times larger than what we have in a, on a processor. So a one dimension, and if you go to two dimension, that's 1000 square. So we can say that's one million times smaller, uh, larger. So, uh, and there is very poor signal processing. It's just a wire actually in optic. Uh, there is little signal processing in optical fiber. So is plasmon a way to mix these two uh, world? And that's what I will show you next. The first thing is, can we use the plasmon as kind of wire for this plasmonic wave? That would be cool because we would have some uh, metallic wire that will be able to transport uh, optical uh, signal at very high frequency with very high carrier frequency. But there is a but, there is an issue, is that uh, if we go back to the relationship that we are here and that we remember that uh, the directly permittivity of the metal is actually a complex number, mostly negative, but with this tiny 1.2i in the case of gold, you place that into this relationship and you end up with a KSPP that has several components and one which is imaginary in the X direction. And as a, a result, you have this kind of wave. So we already talked about the thing that uh, it's vanishing in the Z direction and here also. So that's, that's nice. That's the uh, confinement of the wave in the, into that direction. But it's also, it's also vanishing into that direction with a limited uh, propagation length. If you do the math, you can calculate that uh, at 633 nanometers, so the helium neon uh, laser wavelength, the propagation length is just 11 micrometer. It's very, very little. If you go to the telecommunication wave, uh, wavelength, 1.5 micrometer, it goes up to 300 micrometer. So it's a nice wire, but very short. So there have been a lot of efforts to try to optimize this uh, length uh, propagation. And this, this is what we call the plasmonic waveguides. Um, so the first, which is not a waveguide, that's a starting point, that's this metallic plate. It's not a waveguide because the wave is crawling all over the surface. But now if you go to metallic strip like, like this, uh, you, you can uh, direct the, the wave through this uh, gold, gold, slip, uh, gold stripe here, strip uh, here. And uh, you, you, you increase the propagation length to 7,000 micrometers or seven millimeter, so which is much better. Uh, and what is nice also is that if you see the dimension here, it's just two micrometer and 30 nanometer in thickness. So compared to optical fiber, it's much better. 
uh, you can engineer something different like this. It's even smaller. And then the propagation length is three micrometer. Uh, but I mean, it's not really long, but it's enough to do some small signal processing. And the, the last one, so there are maybe 20 different uh, uh, waveguides that have been studied uh, so in that field. Uh, and the one I will discuss a little bit more is the V-groove with the channel plate, uh, channel uh, pl uh, pl uh, plasma polariton. So this one is uh, just a gold layer with a trench that is be being milled into the, 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 the gold layer. As a result, the propagation length is very small, 20 micrometer, but the wave propagates really in the end, so it's really, really highly confined. So with this, we have a very tiny wave. We don't have crosstalk between uh, neighboring uh, channels, so that, that's nice. And that's something that uh, can be used to do some very short uh, length signal processing. Here, there is always a trade-off, as you can see. We can either have a long, rather long uh, propagation distance, but a poor confinement, actually, because the energy is, uh, of the wave is mostly outside of the metal, or you can have a great confinement, but in that case, you will have a poor uh, propagation length. I'll show you an example of this plasmonic waveguide, which is the spacer. So the spacer, that's the surface plasma amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, that's a plasmonic laser, said in other words. And this has been done uh, by a group uh, in Barcelona, uh, Romain Quidon, uh, yeah, in, so some five years ago. And it's in, in goal, they have uh, uh, made this trench, so that's the, the plasmon uh, waveguide. And on the bottom of the, them, they have placed a laser nanowire. And so this laser, they can pump the laser with an external wavelength at 730 nanometer. And this, the laser has the two mirror, so it's like a usual laser with an amplification medium here and the two mirrors there. And so it launched a wave inside the evanescent wave, and you end up with a laser that is uh, circulating inside this channel plate. And here you can see the results when you have just spontaneous, spontaneous emission, so that's just a broadband emission. And when you tune the laser correctly, you have the excitation laser actually, you can have this laser line, very nice one and very intense one. And so that's the first building block of a uh, plasmon processing system. The idea would be to do something like this, plasmonic circuitry, where everything could be plasmonic. Here uh, on this, this view graph here, and it's artistic view because it doesn't exist so far, uh, there is a plasmonic laser modulator. Modulator, that's a, a device that can send zero and one, so transform the signal into binary signal. Then a transducer that sends this into uh, an optical fiber to transport this information far away. And then uh, when it's come back, there, there are some photo detector based on plasmonics. All these different devices have been engineering, so uh, has been done, realized so far. They have never been integrated together. Uh, I'm not sure there are right now some uh, real application, maybe in the, the watch with the, you know, there are more and more sensor in the intelligent watch and maybe the plasmonic may arrive here. Okay, uh, plasmonic circuitry. So with this, uh, that's what I, I could show you about the propagating plasmon. So the one that is crawling along the surface and now we will go to the localized plasma on the different application. So here we have the nanoparticle. We send light on the nanoparticle. If the particle is not nano, so the uh, order of magnitude of the wavelength, nothing will happen. That just, uh, well, nothing will happen, just metallic, let's say. But if you shrink the, the, the nanoparticle that the, the size is smaller, much smaller than the wavelength, what happens is that this nan small nanoparticle will see an almost homogeneous uh, electric field across it. And so this, what we call the electrostatic application, it's not static, but actually it's an homogeneous field going through the nanoparticle. It generates a polarization of the particle. And this polarization uh, 
is proportional to electric field with a proportional coefficient, which is the polarizability here, alpha. And everything is in this alpha. As the same that the relation dispersion or dispersion for SPP was really important here, the alpha is really important. And again, you have these two dielectric permittivity, the one of the metal, negative one, and the one from the surrounding medium. If you take water, for example, water, the index is 1.33, the dielectric function is the square of it, so 1.7, and then twice this is something as 3.6. I'm saying this because now if epsilon, which is negative, turns to be the same amount that 36, it goes to zero. When it goes to zero, we have a resonance. And that's what happened with the nanoparticle. If we just plot this uh, alpha, we got this curve that you know very, very well, which has a peak uh, exactly when epsilon matches twice uh, epsilon dielectric here. And that's what explains the red color, the ruby red color of spherical nanoparticle, because 520 nanometer, it's green. So the green is absorbed. So what you get uh, the remain is the complementary color of the green, which is the, the red, the ruby red. Um, and so this very small formula works when you have sphere of very small uh, uh, diameter, let's say 10 to 20 nanometer. And now I will illustrate three different applications um, linked to this. We have the incident field coming to the nanoparticle. What happens? Part of the energy is absorbed by the nanoparticle, usually transformed into heat. So I will talk about nanothermy, about this. Part of the energy is scattered by the nanoparticle and can be detected. And uh, I will talk about the color, the pigment that we can create using this phenomenon. And the remaining energy goes through, and that's uh, what gives way to the extinction coefficient that we know. And the way of calculating it is using the uh, cross sections. And so it's just kind of um, proportionality coefficient between the energy you shine to the nanoparticle and the energy which is uh, treated either by absorption, scattering, or extinction. Let's start with the extinction. That's the easiest one. Um, Again, the polarizability with this uh, epsilon plus two dielectric uh, means that the resonance will be extremely sensitive to the nature of the, the surrounding medium. If we have uh, air, it's one. If you, we go to place the nanoparticle into water, it go to uh, optical index 1.3, and then we can plot the extinction cur curve like this, and here, that's with air, and we slightly increase the surrounding medium to 1.8. And what we see is that the peak shifts to higher wavelength, and there is an increase of the absorbance peak as well. What is really interesting is how much that this peak shifts as a function of the, uh, the optical index. There is, uh, we can linearize this one, and we have this kind of formula. Delta lambda is proportional with a proportionality coefficient, which is called the sensitivity factor. And what we want is to have the highest sensitivity factor, so can we, uh, so, so that we can have the highest sensitivity to the surrounding medium. And we have like a, yeah, a nano sensor, really nano, that is able to sense the, the nature of what is uh, uh, surrounding the, the nanoparticle. We can go even a bit further. I was changing the bulk surrounding medium, but I can change just one more layer around the nanoparticle. So having a monolayer like this, or even a partial coverage with the, the, the dotted line I, I placed here. And there is a formula that has been established by Van Duin, so who is really a pioneer of the localized surface plasma resonance, who by the way passed away, I mean, a few months ago. And, um, he made this formula where you have the sensitivity factor, delta n, that's the difference between the optical index of the molecule in yellow here and the solvent, and an exponential term. What is interesting here is that it depends on the length of the molecule and it depends on LD, the electromagnetic decay length that I will talk a little bit later because it's related to what we call the hotspots. Um, 
just a quick example from, so again, I, as a teacher, I was really uh, trying to, to check all the formula I was giving to, to my students. So I checked this formula with experiments. And so I tried these two molecule, uh, so thiol molecule that are attaching around a nanoparticle with two different lengths. And I could check that by increasing slowly the concentration in the solution, I go from partial coverage to full coverage. And I see that uh, I get this saturation of the surface. Here, I'm just plotting the uh, sh wavelength shift here as a function of the amount of thiol. And with this, I could check that the, the, this formula works well, which is not new, but actually that, that's really useful when you are working plasmonics, if you want to have an idea of what kind of shift you expect when you use that kind of molecule, that kind of coverage, and so and it, it works really well. What's, what it shows here is it depends on the length of the molecule, so it strongly depends on the electric field around the nanoparticle in very close vicinity to the nanoparticle. Because here we have just a change of uh, 0.5 nanometer, the length. And from this, we have a big changes in the plasmonic uh, response. Why that? Because actually uh, the electric field around an particle is not homogeneous at all. You have here a calculation of the electric field enhancement around a spherical nanoparticle. And you see with the color code that here it goes to that kind of bluish color, which almost an amplification of 10. So the field around a nanoparticle is 10 times higher than the excitation field at these two points. And this is kind of uh, uh, lens effect, I mean, concentration effect of the electric field around nanoparticle that makes this great sensitivity of any kind of nanoparticle to the molecule surrounding. Uh, and if you go to something a bit more elaborate, so a dimer, so the electric field, electric field is even more concentrated in these hot spots. You see there, there are a, uh, amplification until something like 50. And that's, that's I mean, that's where uh, Van Duin, who was really a pioneer of SERS, was really realizing that the enhancement of SERS is due to hotspots. So very localized uh, amplification of the electric field at a scale which is uh, 500 times smaller than the wavelength. So for people working in optics, that was really something, something really strange and not useful, um, usual. You have to speed up. Um, and so there have been a great deal by the chemical magician, I will say, to engineer the shapes so that the sensitivity factor could be increased more and more. And so the higher the sensitivity factor, the higher you have a sensing of the molecules that, that are around. And for example, this one, a uh, core shell nanoparticle with a gold shell, you have a sensitivity factor of 350. Well. Let's talk about scattering now. We have the electromagnetic field coming to the, the nanoparticle and part of it is scattered. Here, that's very important numbers. The scattering efficiency grows with the power of six of the radius of the nanoparticle, whereas the extinction goes with the power of three. And so if you calculate this scattering efficiency, you can see that with a particle of 20 nanometer, there is almost no scattering, that's the green line. You increase the, 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 the radius, it goes to, it grows up a little bit. And then with 100 nanometer, it's even uh, larger than the absorption. It means that the scattering is not negligible anymore when you go to larger nanoparticle. And you can see it. And if you now use a, a film containing nanoparticle of sufficient uh, diameter, we can see, if you, we look at transmission, we can see the absorption of the nanoparticle. And if you look at it in scattering, we will see the uh, scattering of it. That means two different colors. Two different colors because uh, in absorption, what you see is what has not been absorbed, so that the complementary color. And in scattering, you see what is re-emitted, which is the peak uh, itself. And this was the, I mean, that's the working principle of the famous Likurgus cup. I didn't, uh, I, I didn't place this Likurgus cup here because I think you all know it. 
but I, I placed what uh, I have done with uh, William Watkins with the idea of can we use this kind of very uh, nice effects to go into a startup company and to propose some special pigments with this kind of color. Here you see, so we, we place this nanoparticle into a, a pellet like this. And as you can see, uh, hopefully, yeah, it's blue when you see, look at it in transparency. And wow, it's turned to orange now. And so here we have switched from uh, absorption, so the transmission in the blue, and to the scattering, uh, which is orange. So we have two colors in the same material, depending on you know, from what side you look, at, you look at it. And with this, we came up to a collaboration with a designer in Paris to engineer some, yeah, so, some uh, lamp for, uh, that, that use these bichromatic effects. And so it's still an ongoing, uh, ongoing experience, uh, actually, uh, experience to set up this uh, startup company. Well, now can we uh, see the color of this individual nanoparticle? Uh, yes, that's that's possible when we use some uh, special microscopes, the dark field microscope. It's not so special, but I mean that's something you have to uh, to work out a little bit. And there have been some poster about this uh, uh, on the yesterday presentation. Um, so, scattering so the dark field microscope, the one I'm using, it's an objective from Nikon, which is really nice because they have the illumination from the side. And then, if you have the particle, the particle will scatter in all the direction, uh, okay, like this. And it will collect. Uh, in the uh, objective in the, in the middle. If there is no particle, actually, uh, you see nothing because the ray, the beam is going outside of the collection uh, microscope. And what is really nice is with this, you can even uh, have images like the James Webb telescope like this. So here, uh, that's my small sky actually of nanoparticle. Uh, obtained with uh, this uh, dark field microscope. So we can do the journey and go uh, try to even to land, not on the moon, but on a nanoparticle. So here you see the scratch I made to be able to locate one single nanoparticle into that sky. Then we zoom in then I change the magnification and you see the color of the nanoparticle coming up. We see they are not all green, so that's what is nice. Indication of something chemical which is different there. And then we land with the AFM image on this specific nanoparticle, and we can see them individually. Here we can see the diffraction of the single nanoparticle. We can see particle that probably hotspots that look uh, different colors. And from this, we can even go to single nanoparticle. Uh, and by addressing a spectrometer, we can have the spectrum of this all nano this particle and even um, locate some dimers. And we see when it died, this, uh, this dimer, we see the two peaks of this plasmon uh, lift, the lift of degeneracy of the plasmon band. Um, and so when I had that, I was really uh, acknowledging that I had this plasmonic patient really planting me because that's really so nice, these pictures. Well, um, if, uh, the, fifth, uh, the application number five is the absorption link, uh, linked to the, um, the application link to the absorption into of the nanopart into the nanoparticle, and I will briefly illustrate with something you might probably know: the nanoheating and cancer therapy and the work by Naomi Alas. Uh, so she has been designing nano shell with a high uh, absorption uh, coefficient that is able to absorb the light at 800 nanometer in the biological window, and the idea here is to use the plasmon light to generate some local heating. 
And then uh, using the APR effect, she was able to target some cancer cell uh, for the prostate uh, cancer. And then shining near infrared laser light, the light is absorbed by the nanoparticle and it results in a localized heating of 10 degrees, which is more than enough to kill the cell. And uh, when Naomi Alas was uh, in Paris for the Gold Conference, she was explaining us that uh, she had the first patient cured uh, by this uh, treatment orolas, which is really impressive that the dates that are here, she started working on this in 2002 by the synthesis of this nano shell. Then she started the, two, the, the clinical trial in 2009. Then the first patient inclusion that was 2016, and then the cure that was 2018. And so this number, they are just crazy, I don't know, but it took 16 years from the initial idea to go to the actual uh, curation of the patient. And so that's the message too. We have to be very patient in our application and very sturdy uh, to make sure that we go until that stage. Well, so that's, I think that's a very nice uh, application to the, from the, the plasmonics. Okay. So now we need to go to uh, a slow motion, let's say, uh, to the tempo to zero. So far, I have been talking about uh, the, um, the plasmonic excitation at the optical wavelength, very high tempo. And now I will stop the omega and go to electrostatics. And um, that's the same electrons, but this time they are uh, static into the nanoparticle. They are not oscillating at 10 to the 15 Hertz. And here, it's completely different topics, which we might say, because that's what I call nanoelectronics, where um, you have two medium, gold, so metal and a semiconductor. And when you place these two, what characterizes these two medium, that's the work function. So the energy you need to extract an electron and to put that electron into vacuum. Uh, and every metal is characterized by this work function. When you put these two uh, metal and semiconductor together, there is uh, the electron from the conduction run of the uh, silicon will go to the metal because the metal has a higher work function than silicon. It ends up with a local charge redistribution that when you drive, uh, you draw the band diagram, uh, the charge, there is a plus charge on the semiconductor and here uh, minus on the metal and it ends up in a band bending. And so as a uh, matter, when you now have this contact, you want to send electron from the metal to the semiconductor, you have a supplemental barrier to cross, which is a shot key barrier. So this shot key barrier made difficult to inject electron into the semiconductor. And the whole idea is how to engineer this shot key barrier, uh, how to jump over this shot key barrier. Uh, one big issue is to know the value of this shot key barrier. We know it when we have plain metal, uh, planar metal and planar semiconductor. But what happens when we have a small nanoparticle? What is actually the value of the work function of a spherical nanoparticle? Um, and this is not an easy uh, answer. The work function of the goal at nanoscale is not the one of the goal at the macro scale for a couple of reasons, for two reasons. There is first the interface effects. That's what I've just talked about with the short key barrier. We have two material of different work function. When you place them into contact, there is a re-equilibration of the charges that ends up with negative charges on nanoparticles. As a result, uh, there is an apparent decrease of the work function it's easier to extract the electron from the nanoparticle because there is already a negative charge. So the electron is pushed out. So it decreases the work function. But when you go to small sizes, when you want to extract this electron, what happens is when you uh, pull the electron, there is an image charge below, which is positive. And so these two charges tend to attract themselves. And this will um, yeah, make more difficult to extract the electron. When you go to a nanoparticle, this image charge is more localized. So the interaction between this charge and image charge is stronger. So you expect to increase the work functions so at two different effects. The, the second effect has been uh, plotted by the Wood formula in 1891. That's a PRL paper in just one page where he demonstrated this. 
And what is really interesting for those who are doing uh, catalytics, for catalysis, for example, is that when you go to smaller than 10 nanometer, you see that the work function of gold sharply increase in of two, uh, 0.2 electron volt. That's really a large number. And that's probably very important when you want to understand the work function of uh, small nanoparticles. And so I decided to check this by using a conductive AFM, or more specific, specifically a Kelvin probe force microscopy, KPFM, that is able to measure the contact potential difference. It works that way. You have the work function of the sample, the work function of the tip here. When you place them together, there is again this kind of charge equilibration. When you have plus and minus, there is uh, attracting force. And as you know, the FM is very good at measuring the attracting force. So you can nullify this attracting force by applying a counter potential that we call C VCPD, the contact potential difference. And when this uh, force is zero, because you have canceled the charge, these charges, that means that VCBD is equal to the work function difference. So with this, you have access to the local work function of single nano objects. And uh, I mean, it took me maybe 10 years to engineer the proper surface, to engineer the proper nanoparticle, to learn how to use this KPFM, and the result is here. Here you see nanoparticle of different sizes, and the color co corresponds to the potential of this uh, nanoparticle. We can have uh, a section uh, plots of uh, these five nanoparticles, and the result is here. When you have a 40 nanometer nanoparticle, the work function is 3.75, so quite away from the five electron volt that we expect for gold. And we can calculate that this uh, small nanoparticle has six supplementary electrons uh, in it. When you go to larger nanoparticle, there are 13 electrons, a bit more, but not so more because the size. Uh, I mean, the volume grows with the cubic uh, the air cube, actually. And the um, work function goes further, closer to the actual uh, work function of uh, gold, actually. And with this, uh, we, we could demonstrate that the apparent work function of the nanoparticle in close contact with the semiconductor is not the one of the isolated gold. So we, that's a test experiment. What happens now if I take gold on gold, same material, I shouldn't have any uh, uh, CPD, contact potential difference uh, together. And um, that's what happens. That's fantastic picture here. You see from obtained by a PhD student. You see what you see, that's this kind of trenches. So that's uh, boundary, uh, grain boundary of the 111 domain of the, the gold that has been flamed before. And as you know, from surface physics, the 111 work function is not the one, the, the same one as the 110. And so you see the uh, grain boundary and you can distinguish the nanoparticle, but they are barely visible because actually their work function is the same as the one of the gold. And because they are larger than the 10 nanometer uh, limit that I was discussing before, and uh, so this is demonstration that the work function of the gold nanoparticle, I mean, they are close to gold when it's higher than 10. Then with, the, with Leo, so my, my PhD student, what we did is to cover the nanoparticle with a given um, uh, molecule, the one I was, uh, the mercapto undecal decanoic acid I was demonstrating before uh, with the LSPR. And with this, we add, um, dipolar moment to every nanoparticle that changed the work function. And here now we see the nanoparticle because we have triggered, modulate their, their work function. So uh, here, uh, there are th three main uh, factor that will affect the actual work function of nanoparticle, that's their size, the substrates on, on which they are lying and the surrounding of the nanoparticle. Well, so during the last three minutes, uh, I will go to, just go to last, the last uh, topic with the hot carrier physics. How can we mix these two uh, knowledge together? The plasmonic at high tempo and the electrostatic at omega equal zero. Um, so first, what, what are these hot electrons that we are talking about? Um, it's known since Einstein, so we have to cite Einstein. Uh, that's, there is the photoelectric effects. So when you shine a photon on a metal, 
if the energy is large enough, you can uh, send away this, that electron. That's a photoelectric effect. But what happens when the uh, energy is lower than the work function? Then this electron will quickly decay back to the ground state and nothing happens except a little bit of heating. But if we look at it closer in the time scale, uh, like this, this OLED electron that's over the time of 20 femtoseconds, so very, very quick, they are excited at the uh, excited state, and they will quickly release the energy to the neighboring electrons with Lando damping. And then after a few times, one picosecond, the all electron will have been excited by this kind of booming electron that has been excited by the, the photon. And uh, after 100 picoseconds and so, this excited electron will release the energy to the network, so, so to the metal, it's to the core ion themselves. And it goes back to uh, equilibrium. So hot electron is a way to catch this electron before they have the time to relax back to this equilibrium state. How can we do that? Uh, we can do that by using I've, what I've just explained, this uh, short key junction where there is a strong electric field that can uh, pull this electron out. Before this, uh, why is plasmonics here? Plasmonic is there because uh, some theoreticians have calculated that the cross-section of excitation of hot electrons is proportional to absorption of the nanoparticle. The more particle absorb, the more it will generate hot electrons. So if you want to have a hot electron source, what you need is to have something with hot spots, actually. And so that's the whole uh, physics that is behind. You use plasmonics to generate this electron, and then you use electrostatics, electrostatics to catch these electrons. And one example is given by what uh, is called the smallest spectrometer in the world, and that will be my, my last slide, so be patient for the coffee. Um, here, they have done uh, a nano road, let's say, that have a specific plasmonic wavelength. So this nano road is embedded in on silicon, so on a semiconductor, so that we have this short key barrier, plus there is ITO to collect uh, electrons that are, can be generated. So they have an array of these uh, different uh, nano roads. And then since it's in contact with the silicon, there is short key barrier. Um, so they generate the hot electron with high energy enough to jump over this short key barrier. And then here, if there is this slope, that means there is an electric field and that electron may be attracted by the silicon and collected by the silicon. Um, if you change the length of these uh, nano roads, you will change the energy of the hot electron you, you can generate. And the results are here. Here, uh, you see, the electrical signal, which is measured by the, this detector. And here you can see uh, the LSPR um, uh, resonance. That means that this is the, the length of this nano road, 110 nanometer, and they go to 158. With this, they can change actually uh, the wavelength of ex excitation. And uh, here they measure the electrical signal that really follow this kind of uh, plasmonic excitation. So as a result, they have made a device which is able to detect specific uh, wavelength and that this device is no, nothing else than a, a, a spectrometer with a size of uh, something at 200 nanometer. And so this is a nice demonstration of what can we do, okay, the, the thing that can be done with uh, the hot electrons. And um, actually that was, the topic of a Faraday discussion held in London in 2019, so the 300 of this series uh, of the Faraday discussion, called Hot Electron Science on Microscopic Processing in Plasmoning and Catalysis. And in this topic, where I mean the most prominent scientists in uh, plasmonics and condensed matter physics were gathered, they, they underlined some vibrant topics. So how the geometry of the nanoparticle uh, can be tuned to generate these efficient hot electrons how photocatalysis can ad take advantage of this. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of fundamental understanding needed of the time scales. And there is a large debate going on right now to, to decide if the hot electron is not just some uh, nanothermics uh, 
yeah, on the, the chemical base uh, from, uh, working of the, this uh, nanocatalysis activity. Well, that's really a topic that's uh, which is coming out from plasmonics and uh, really, really interesting uh, right now. To finish, uh, I'm oh, glad to present you if you want to know more. So uh, I, advertise, I can advertise for the book that I, I wrote with a colleague from uh, uh, Sherbrooke University, so close by here, which is really an introduction for master students. So plasmonics, there are plenty of books, contributed books, but if you start creating them, it goes very quickly to very specialized. So that's, that's very nice for the specialists. But if you want the introduction, we had the, the feeling that we had to fill the gap. And so that will be, yeah, we bring this element to the community and it's, uh, it will be published in October. And then I need to acknowledge, I mean, the Ornano community that I'm, yeah, I'm really proud to be, I mean, to be in and to be the, the head of it because it's really active. And that's from this community that I, I could have so many interaction ideas. And so, and that's really, yeah, that's really part of the passion that I developed for the, the plasmonics. And of course, to all the people who have contributed to this, uh, to this work, my PhD students, technical staffs and colleagues. And I want to thank you for your patience and attention for this uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier, Dr. Pucheri, for your wonderful talk. So we'll take a few minutes for some questions. So 